very much to all the good people of this bookstore for inviting me here to, to give this reading and to talk. It's a great pleasure to be back here again in, in Liverpool and uh, to be here on such a sunny day. God, today was beautiful, wasn't it? Uh, walked around the city and uh, went to your two cathedrals and that. So I'm going to read uh, a couple of pages from uh, Soul of Bones uh, for about six or seven or eight minutes and that. And I've chosen to read... Uh, a part in the middle of the book, a pivotal part, a, s- a scene in the middle of the book where the protagonist, Marcus Conway, comes home. And Marcus is an engineer. He works at the county council, civil engineer. He's roads, houses, bridges, that kind of thing. And one of, the, one of the things that the book is about is about... One of the things that I think the book is about, even though it's not confined to these things, but one of the things the book is about is that is his... Uh, the various declensions of masculinity, what it is to be a father, a husband, a brother, a son, an engineer. And, but in this particular episode that happens here, he comes home and he's asked to be something else. He has to step up into himself and become something else entirely. And uh, he's, not all sure that he, he's not at all sure that he's up for the job. Uh, so here he is, he comes home and his wife, Maraid, is in bed. It was Friday when I came home and I found she'd been sick since morning. Nausea and fever for the first couple of hours, but worsening to cramps and puking in the afternoon, keeping her in bed with the curtains drawn, a livid flush in her cheeks and a gloss of sweat on her face, her voice a thready rasp of itself and her whispering. It's been like this all day. I can't hold anything down. It was a shock to see her like that, lying there, all the energy twisted out of her, this woman who never took to the bed for any reason whatsoever, and do you want me to call the doctor? You're burning up. As I laid a hand on my forehead, which in spite of appearances felt cold beneath the sweaty sheen, so no, no, it's only a bug. It'll be gone in the morning. All I need is a bit of sleep, and you're all right besides, though. And her face narrowing into a tight grimace when I've got these cramps. They come and they go through my stomach. I have them all afternoon. They're not getting any better. If I could just get some sleep. Before her misery came to a head later that evening, when I was in the kitchen and her voice called weakly from the bedroom, and I found her leaning over the side of the bed, vomiting a green wash into a basin, her body purging itself in a spasm of spew, a rinse of bitter filths loosened up out of her as if it were being pumped deep from deep within with such a twisting force. She was now almost out of the bed, resting her hand on the floor, bracing herself over the basin. And she continued to disgorge, her body now almost head down on the floor, on which, after another view about a puking, I finally drew her up and settled her back within the pillow, where she lay, snuffling and trembling. So that's it, I said, I'm calling the doctor. No, she rasped, not yet. And the look of pain on her face sank beneath a look of shame and alarm which lifted up her chin as she said weakly, I have to go to the bathroom and I need you to change these sheets. Okay, I'll throw them in the washing machine. No, not the washing machine, throw them out in the duvet cover also, she said, in her voice now with an imploring undernote to its breathlessness, which I did not understand till she glared meaningfully into the middle of the bed, her shame now burning under a tide of rage which drew her up with gritted teeth to say, leave the room. You're not able to get up on your own. For Christ's sake, leave the room, or you'll regret it, she barked. An outburst which momentarily drained her of all her strength away, pushing her back into the pillows with a heavy grasp as I turned from the floor and pulled the door behind me, returning only when I heard the shower running in the bathroom to pick up the sheets, the duvet cover and the nightdress, which were gathered into a tight ball in the middle of the floor, where the air was thick with the smell of vomit and that other filth which had been drawn from her body, now bundled up in these sheets, which I pushed into the wheelie bin outside the back door, and then waited with a change of nightdress for her when she stepped out of the shower, which she did, and after a few minutes to stand swaying on the tiled floor, heat blushed and dizzy, with steam rising from her pale shoulders as if she was some newborn thing. So I took a towel and dried her off before slipping the nightdress over her head. And then I did something I had not done in the longest time. I gathered her up in my arms and carried her down the hall to Agnes's room, which, she was all, which was already made up, to sit her on the side of the bed, where she balanced, breathless and trembling, swaying to one side, 
as I looped the towel around her head and I dried her hair as gently as possible. And then I ran a brush through it so that when she lay back into the pillow, her face was opened with a fevered heat coming off her in scented waves gasping. Thank you. Her eyes closing as she spoke, all her strength needed to draw the two words up from inside her and I'm ringing the doctor now, this needs to be seen too. Yes. And I, her exhaustion pushed her off to sleep as I made the phone call to the clinic where the receptionist told me that Mara's GP was on leave but they put me onto a woman with a quiet telephone manner who requested that I detail clearly all the symptoms, how long they'd been in place, all the vomiting and the cramps and the diarrhea and the fever. After which she said she'd be the nurse, she'd be at the house in 20 minutes, and indeed she was. And there was a pleasing difference between the calm voice on the phone uh, and, the, and the wild-haired woman who sat on the side of Mara's bed, taking her temperature and pulse. A young woman in an oversized mac with cuffs rolled up over her wrists and whose face it took me a long moment to recognise, but eventually it came to me, a neighbour's child, one of the Cosgraves of Derry. I'll leave it there for a second. Thank you. So that's the scene where he comes home and he's... Uh, it's, uh, it's page 119. It's just shortly, shortly in the middle of in the book and he has to step up out of himself and to become something other than an engineer and a father and a husband. And that. He, he has to become her carer at that point and kind of governs governs the rest of the novel and that. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Mike's going to read uh, again in, in a few minutes, but I thought maybe I'd, I'd uh, ask a couple of questions. Um, <coughs> I, I've been debating whether to do this, but I'm going to go ahead and spoil it all for everyone uh, who hasn't read it. And at, at the heart of the, of the, of the novel and, and the way it works is, is the fact that the narrator, Marcus Conway, this engineer, is dead. Um, and I don't think I am spoiling it by telling you that, um, although we, my students, several of whom I see here, we debated this the other day, is does it change the nature of the way you read the novel if you know that? Uh, but anyway, there you go, I've told you now. And I wondered, Mike, were you conscious of being part of an Irish tradition of writing from beyond the grave? I'm thinking of something like Flann O'Brien's The Third Policeman or um, Yeats's All Souls Night when you yeah. were writing the book? I wasn't, not at all. Uh, but it's quite a crowded shelf, Crane uh, It is, we do this, we, we have, it's, it's a recurring kind of a trope, whereas Anna in Scotland have people with two, with two dispositions, whereas in, in Ireland we're sometimes neither dead nor alive on that. And, um, and certainly it's been the case in, in, it's been the case in my own work uh, where I have, and certainly in my three novels, where I have central characters who are neither dead nor alive, like uh, J.J. O'Malley in, is in a coma uh, uh, for the entire book. And um, in the previous one, Crow, is he seems to have fallen out of the sky as some sort of an angel. Uh, so my the three characters, through no design, but just the way they've emerged, seems to have come, seems to have... Um, have uh, inhabit this 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 space which is betwixt and between and that and i wasn't i i didn't i certainly didn't say to myself you know i'm going to write a book now and i'm going to place it squarely in that tradition of men that are neither dead nor alive and that i didn't do that it's just the way mm. just the way it came to me in that mm -hmm. it came to me you know i was talking talking where do you get your ideas from what do they start from and everything one of the one and i'm, I'm my education as a artist, writer and everything like that. It was in my 20s, I spent all my time living with artists, um, with photographers and um, with photographers and painters and uh, sculptors and that. So I got this, got this really intense kind of visual education. So an awful lot of my starting points tend to be visual starting points. And the, the, the starting point for this book was this man in in his own house, in his own kitchen, blundering around in the middle of the day. And the whole book for me after that became how, the unravelling of that image. Why is he at home in the middle of the day? Because I, one of the things I like about my characters is, is uh, one of the things I always dispose to do is to get them out to work. 
get them out doing something. This man's at home in the middle of the day, listening to the Angelus. What's he doing there? Why is he doing that? Um, how come he's so baffled about being in his own house? What, what is it about that that baffles him and that? And why is he going on at length? Uh, so the whole book became an unravelling of that Genesis moment, that Genesis image uh, that, uh, that uh, kind of governs the book from there on. Does Marcus Conway know he's dead? He doesn't, I don't think so. Um, and I thought that this was one of the things that he doesn't... This is one of the decisions we made at Tramp Press was because it seemed to me to be obvious to the reader as a reader that he was dead. Um, although a couple of people come back to me and said, Tommy Tiernan <laughs> gave a great speech on it. He said, I know he's dead at all. <laughs> uh, um, uh, he, we made this decision because it seemed to be so obvious from the beginning to, to just repeat what the, the, writer was going, the reader was going to find out within five or ten pages and that, that, uh, that he was dead. And, um, and it sets up, a, and I liked that, because it sets up a, a bigger demand off the book thing. It's very obvious then that, that uh, the way the book is going to end, uh, if you have that, as uh, 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 if you start that way, you, the end becomes obvious. So then how do you pull off an end that's obvious? That, that was the ask of the, of the book on that. And I thought, it, I, thought it by, I thought by revealing it that it, the book played to higher stakes and it played to a higher expectation. And the reader was there, okay, I know how this is going to end. Okay, how are you going to pull it off? So I yeah. had a crack at pulling it off. It was never a case that... <laughs> it's, it was never a case that it wasn't going to be... We very quickly decided in, uh, for the... For the uh, that we sit down, yeah, okay, he's, he's dead. Uh, he's dead, everyone will realise that within five or ten pages. And that, was it. Uh, that can't have been an easy sell. So when you wrote the book, uh, however, and we can talk about how you write in a minute, but when you wrote the book and you thought, right, here I am now, this is my masterpiece, I'm going to send this out <laughs> into the world. Um, and the world uh, is going to uh, clamour to uh, it. Uh, yes, exactly. what did the world say? What did the world say when you sent it out first? And how did it come to be published? Uh, they said two words, and the second one of them is off. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I sent. You know, I, I don't know if you know my. I don't know if you know my kind of publishing history, but I was. My first three books were was at a, a swanky London publisher, uh, Jonathan Cape. And they published three books that were critically, I suppose, well received in that, but which disappeared without trace. And then after the third one, I, I got uh, I got dropped. One of these periodic culls that go through big publishing houses, and and uh, the, the the lads who are on the subs bench get 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 cut away, get cut adrift. And I was one of those people. And and when that happens to you at the age of forty, and that. Uh, the mark of Cain is on you. No one's going to touch you after that in a big publishing house. So I had a book of short stories. I, I had a novel that no one published. And I had a book of short stories that was published by an Irish publisher and that sank without trace. And then I went and I wrote a book in which there was no full stops. And I just seemed to think that the world would clamor to this. And I sent that book out. And I, I, sent, I gave it to my agent, Marianne Gunn O'Connor, and she came back to me within two or three weeks of, of getting it, and she said, I'm so excited by this. She said, I am, I am uh, more excited by this than anything you've ever given me, and I believe I can sell this book. And um, I was saying, woohoo, great. And so she comes back in three months later, and she says, I can't sell it. No one wants to, no one wants to, to know. Um, everyone's hemming and hawing and pissing and moaning about it and that. She says, and... Uh, no one wants to the the style of the book. No one wants to go with it. Um, the the whole domesticity of the thing. It's a departure from what you've done and everything like that. So then we had a then we had a. It lay there for a long time, uh, and uh, and then we had a, a conversation with uh, Tram Press, who were whom I had worked with at my previous publisher, and that. They rang up and they said, what's Mike doing? Is it true he has a manuscript and that? And they said yes. And uh, we sat down and myself and Marianne says, let's, let's send it to them and that. Let's see what they, they make of it and that. So I sent it to them and they, they invited me. They said, we're coming to Galway. We would like to take you out for something to eat. And brought me to Kai Restaurant on, on Sea Road in Galway City, where I'm from and that. I live in the west of Ireland and Galway. And they said, so they sat me down. And they 
put a bowl of soup in front of me and they proceeded to talk for 10-15 minutes about the book um, it really was game over I knew that the I knew that the now bear in mind <laughs> the book had nowhere else to go <laughs> Every, I mean and I mean everyone I know that I know that I know that one I know that two editors at I know that two editors at major publishing houses had had brought it to acquisitions meeting and tried to make a case for it so this is a this is a book it's really something we could go for it and the accountants and that says oh yeah it's another McCormick book it'll get great reviews and it'll it'll sell 10 copies and we'll be left with it and uh, so basically at least two editors were overruled on it on that and this is one of the things we're finding so anyways when the book the book was the book um, went to the went to tramp press and they just got behind it and they put their heart and soul into it and they they understood the book completely uh, weren't frightened by the experiment of the book and in fact every everything that other publishers thought was awkward and uh, and unmanageable they saw as an advantage they said no Jesus no no all that stuff domestic stuff no that's great and that engineering stuff yeah let's, let's go with that and no full stop no let's go with that uh, every, everything that everything that other major publishers. So this is why I say as well, this is why, and I mean this sincerely, really interesting, you, you know, the book is about, the book is about all the ass, the book is about this, that, and the next thing, but one of the things, one of the things that I think the book is, with no design on my part, one of the things the book speaks to is all the various aspects of masculinity. And, but the heroes of the book, for me, are, are, are all the women it met. Uh, my wife, the first person who read it and said, yeah, you're on the right track. Um, it needs a shave and a shampoo, but it's, 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 go it's going right. My agent, the first person, she, she was the next person to read it. And then the two women at Tramp Press. And everywhere else, it was men met it and faltered. And it, um, Belinda McKeown made, made the point about the book. Uh, she, she, Belinda makes this point that it's about. She said no. She says the book is about men making worlds that they can't themselves live in. I, I didn't, I, I didn't understand that aspect of it myself. <coughs> men designing systems, engineering systems, even familial systems, and everything that they ultimately can't live in or can't cope with themselves. And that very certainly was the impression, uh, that was my experience of when it went to the book went to publishers. Uh, in Britain and that. And, you know, even in Ireland, my own editor, my last editor at Lilliput, couldn't even get it past his own editorial board and that. So I was really glad to see, you know, what Maura spoke about there. The, the, the book was went out and it got, quickly gained this reputation for being an, an experiment. But it got the reputation for being paradoxically a readable experiment on that, which is... <laughs> experiments are generally fragmented and they're antagonistic and they're disorienting and everything. But this is an old-fashioned experiment, I think, of some sort. And that. You, you mentioned Belinda McKeown's comment about it being a, about a world or a world that men make or fail to make. <coughs> um, and one of the reasons that they fail to make the world, uh, and, and this is an important part of the book, is, is a, a corrupt political system. Yeah. That uh, that Ireland is, and it's probably not just Ireland, uh, but Ireland's the country we know best, and it's certainly evident all around us. Um, and I wondered if you'd say a little bit about um, whether it, it's. It seems to me it's a dark book in some ways, in that it's 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 slightly hopeless. The Gombean politician will always defeat the, um, the, the, the engineer. Uh, but on the other hand, there's a kind of optimism that runs through it, a sort of human optimism of care and domestic love and so yeah. on. I yeah. mean, was there, was, there, was, was there a mood you wanted the, the novel to end up being at? Yeah. Part of it was, one of the things that, that uh, I, I wanted was a, a song to these people who make the world. Uh, that's why I wanted to write, write it about engineers is because writers write about the world and, and singers sing about the world and painters paint the world but engineers make the fucking world you know this city these bridges these libraries these hospitals engineers make them 
we mightn't like that. We, we might wish it was poets, and, and, and <laughs> we might wish it was poets that made them, or that it was, uh, or that it was theologians or metaphysicians that made these. No, it's engineers make these. They design them. They, you, you, you live in a city in which there's two um, you know, absolute architectural and engineering marvels, and you have two cathedrals and that. And it's, it's certainly the Anglican Cathedral. Go to it every time I'm here, and it just strikes me. It seems to me sublime in the Kantian sense, and that uh, you know, beauty and terror, the whole thing mixed into it. And I wanted to, I wanted to, on a, on a vernacular scale, this isn't my engineer makes the world, bridges, roads, houses. Uh, and these are the signatures of our time, and I wanted the book to be a kind of a song of praise to that kind of thing. That was part of it, and that. And um, so he presents. And he's a, he's not just an engineer; he's a county engineer. So he he lies at this juncture between politics and development, money and engineering, and he tries to steer his engineering projects between these rocks. And that everyone pulling and dragging out of these engineering projects, and by the time he gets them through, they're always misshapen, and they're always kind of compromised, and they're never quite the pristine idea that started with. But hey, that's the world, that's life, that's politics, you know. And engineering has to make its own compromise. So, it uh, politics are a, the politics in the book. I just sat down with an engineer for three hours and. He talked and told me about it. Like there's two, there's two very small details, just to point out the lunacy of it, and neither of them are made up. There is a, there is a, there is an art. There's a piece in it where uh, uh, a, a road going through a village, where there's a surface on the road that's, there's a surface in the road that that's, um, too fine. Uh, it should be a more coarser surface because it's going through a village in which there's a school and a pub, and this surface on the road has a breaking distance uh, one and a half times what, it sh what, a normal, what, it sh what a normal road surface would, should be. But the local... The lo this is Morisk, by the way, actually. This, this I remember the next time I'm driving through there, yeah. at, at speed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is an engineer who told me, and he says, he says that surface shouldn't be on that road. He says, us engineers, we argue tooth and nail. The next thing we get a call from politicians that that um, there's 25 blue votes along that road, Fine Gael votes along that road, and if they want sheeted glass on that road, they can have it on that. There's another one. There's uh, there's the, the instance of the the light in the the light in the in the corner of the field. I didn't make that up either. That's that that's that's true, and it's true for the reasons I say. Uh, that there's a that, that there's a whole house with six or eight votes in it there, and. Um, county engineer who told me that mm. he says try taking it down he says you can try and you might get it down but don't try submitting uh, a budget the next year because no one's going to listen to you on account of it so yeah. so um those are all the compromises and um you know he laments the fact that engineers don't make the world politicians make mm -hmm. the world and that and uh, yeah and, uh, well, with, with that in mind, uh, I might ask you to read uh, another section, okay. uh, Mike, which, which, which looks at, this in, is, this in part, the, the crash. This is the section that... Uh, okay, right. This is near the beginning of the book in which, um, in which Marcus kind of brings all his kind of apocalyptic imaginings to what happened to Ireland and, uh, and uh, on the night of November the 2nd, the month of the Holy Souls, this is, it's already upon us and the year's nearly gone. So what happened to October? Come and gone in a flash and the clock's gone back for winter. Time only last week and the front page stories tell him that the world is gone. About its relentless business of rising up in splendour and falling down in ruins. The war still ongoing in foreign parts. Afghanistan and Iraq among others. As peace settlements are attempted elsewhere. Israel and Palestine. We're closer to home, the drama's in a lower key, but real nonetheless. Bed shortages in hospitals and public sector wage agreements under pressure. All good human stories, no matter how they would pan out. You can feel that, the flesh and blood element twitching in them. While at the same time, in the over-realm of international finance, other, more abstract indices are rising and falling to their own havoc. Share prices, interest rates, profit margins, solvency ratios... Money upholding the necessary imbalance so that everything continues to move 
ever forward while on one of the inside pages and there is one year on this long article will it end us with this graph and quotes outlining the causes and consequences of our recent economic collapse a brief resume of events that culminated on the night of september the 29th the feast of the archangel michael the night the whole banking system almost collapsed and the country came within a hair's breadth of waking the following morning to empty bank accounts and for clarity's sake this article is illustrated by a sidebar which gives some indication of just how outsized the nation's financial folly was in the years leading up to the cra- collapse, with debts piling up till it ran to tens of billions, billions, incredible figures for a small island economy, awe-inspiring magnitudes which shifted forever the horizons of what we thought ourselves liable for, and which now stacked one on top of the other like this, all those zeros, all those zeros, glossy and hard, and so given to viral increase, they appear like the indices and the magnitudes of a new cosmology, the forces and velocities of some barren, inverse world, a negative realm that over time is going to suck the life out of us, the collapse which happened without offering any forewarning of itself, none that any of our prophets picked up on anyway, as they were all struck dumb and blind apparently, robbed of all foresight when surely this was the kind of catastrophe prophets should have an eye for or some foreknowledge of but they didn't it was now evidence in hindsight that all our seers gifts are of a lesser order their warnings lowered to a tremulous bleating the voices of men hedging their bets and without the proper pitch of hysterical accusation as they settled instead for fault finding and analysis all that cautionary note which in the end proved wholly inadequate to the coming disaster because pointing out flaws was never going to be enough and figures and projections no matter how dire were never likely to map out the real contours of the calamity or prove to be an adequate spell against it when with a shrill tone of indictment this theirs was never a song to hold our attention and no point whatsoever meeting a catastrophe with reason when what was needed was our prophets deranged and coming towards us wild-eyed and smeared with shit ringing a bell seer and sinner at once while speaking some language from the edge of reason whose message would translate into plain words as we are fucked well and truly <laughs> fucked okay i'll leave that I'll just ask one more question for now and then I'll throw it open to, to uh, the audience for questions for a bit. And that's uh, in that passage there uh, and, and right throughout the novel, um, it strikes me as, as being a kind of a novel that's very interested in religion or at least religious um, yeah. language. And I wondered, is it, it's, it's a book that's set in, in contemporary Ireland, an Ireland in which, in which Catholicism no longer has the hold that it had when we were children, for instance. Yeah. Um, is it a novel, is Marcus Conway someone in search of a religion? Or, or what, what was your sense of the use of, of so much religious language? I, yeah, actually, you know, I, I thought it was a book about faith uh, in, in many ways. And I thought, this is a man who at one stage in, in his life, mis- I think, mistook his own astonishment at being alive and being in the world he mistook that as a faith and he went off to pursue god he went off to minute to pursue god and god god gave him the back of his hand in many ways and told him to cop on to himself and to go away and that and in in place of that marcus appears to have put family and community and engineering these are the things that he's put in his world instead. He's found a creed in these things. And he speaks of them as the, he speaks of them, I think he speaks of them as the basic tenets of belief and that. He speaks of neighborliness and friendliness. He speaks of family. And he speaks of engineering being on the side of the good and that. And uh, the side of the good and the side of justice and human betterment and that. And... <laughs> and in, in a fanciful moment, his son points out to him that he turned away from the cross, but he turned away. He he turned from the cross and he t- took up the theodolite, and he laid the cross of the theodolite. I don't know if you've ever looked through a theodolite in that, and it, which is a with the crosshairs of a theodolite. That he laid the he laid the the surveying instrument. He laid the the crosshairs of the survey of a surveyor's instrument on the land, and that this became his new creed. 
so yeah i fully uh, it's it, to me it, it's it's a book about faith um a man who finds a new who tries to mint a, some new creed or religion from the disparate parts of his life and mm. that mm. Uh, it seems to be happy enough with it uh, mm. uh, as well he he um he calls for his god at the end and mm. i don't know if god, i don't know if god will meet him halfway or yeah. anything like that yeah. Yeah. um there, there are a ton more questions i could ask you mike and hopefully i will ask you in the pub later but i won't ask you publicly now um because i'm conscious we've already uh detained you for for quite a long time and it's been it's been terrific and thank uh, you very much we've really we've really enjoyed it so um i'm sure uh mike will be happy to sign copies of the book and you would like to uh like to get that done or have a word with people afterwards uh but for now i wonder if you just put your hands together please for mike <laughs>